Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Business and financial news outlets are obsessed with the Federal Reserve and more specifically, handicapping when the U.S. Central Bank may or may not raise interest rates, by how much, and how many times. Welcome back and thank you for supporting the most widely watched source of Carolina business and public policy for 25 years now. There is nothing new about this almost neurotic fixation we have about Fed speak and action, but it is important to remember there are so many more levers and dynamics that push and pull our economy. We'll check in with three of our resident economists on commercial activity here and now, as well as how the gravitational pull of some of the acute election rhetoric going on may be affecting ultimate outcomes. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Rick Kaglick of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, Joseph C. Von Nessen, PhD, of the University of South Carolina, and Mike Walden from NC State University. Hello, welcome to our program. Happy summer, and uh, gentlemen, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let's, let's not talk about the dark science of statistical <laughs> and, and, and e economics yet, but Michael, I want to I start with you. How much is this, oh gosh, best way to say it, the ambiguity of the election year rhetoric and the uncertainty about, gosh, who's going to get office and OMG, how did we end <laughs> up with these candidates? And those aren't my words, right. but I think you get the point. How much of that real opaque nature affects the arc of where our economy is headed? Well, certainly some. I mean, businesses always try to forecast where things are going and who's president. All the presidents don't run the economy, although some people think they do. They have an impact. I think probably the betting right now would be that Hillary Clinton would be elected. I think the polls indicate that. And probably the business community maybe feels a little better about that because she's a known quantity. Uh, even though you don't know exactly what policy she follows, she's known quality as a track record. I think if the polls move the other way and Mr. Trump seems to be the likely uh, winner, uh, I think we might see a lot more uncertainty. The uncertainty level go up. But, but there are many other things affecting the economy. But I think clearly this is going to be a very interesting election depending upon how the polls move and how business mm -hmm. leaders read those. Joey, Rick, what do you think? Well, I think the the... This is an interesting election in the sense that we have both candidates which have really uh, gone back and forth, but I think as of right now, they're both against TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And so one of the uh, things that we're looking for is to what degree is that going to impact uh, the U.S. economy and what are... Uh, what is their actual yeah. plan to whether to to go along with that or not? And we see that in South Carolina in particular. South Carolina voted for Donald Trump during the Republican primary, and part of that was this economic populism and getting back to the idea that when we look at this expansion that we're in, it's mainly it comes down to skilled versus unskilled workers. And if you have some form of higher education, at least in South Carolina, uh, that's where we're seeing economic growth, uh, job growth, income mm -hmm. growth. But if you are are out there, you don't have any form of education beyond that of high school, you're looking around and you're saying, what expansion? So I think that response to that economic populism has led both candidates to be uh, uh, agnostic with respect to the TPP. So we don't know what's going to happen from that perspective yet. Well, and good point and good word. Thank you. Agnostic. And I look at the Fed for this, Rick, because the apolitical nature of the Fed in general, mm. 
Is it, do you all model out, okay, under a, a, a Trump presidency or a Trump administration, we could possibly see this, so we're going to have to consider this, or under a Clinton administration, we might have to do it this way. Is there a way to think about, oh, again, first question that I had from Mike, how do you model out how the uncertainty, pretty dramatic uncertainty about this political rhetoric and outcome. How, how, do, you, how do you look at that? I'm, I'm not sure you necessarily can model uncertainty. It's just by its very nature, it's very hard to define when you're, when you're getting into a model. But I think that, that we hear this conversation all the time, every time an election comes up. Uncertainty, how is it impacting the economy? Some people say it is, some people say it isn't. I think it's going to be, if it's having an impact, it's going to be marginal. I think at the end of the day, whether you're looking at household spending or whether you're looking at business spending, Spending, people are going to focus on the fundamentals. So when you get down to it on the household side, people are going to be looking at job creation. We've continued to see relatively strong job creation so far this year. Um, they're going to look at the availability and cost of financing. When you look at businesses, they're going to be taking a look at things such as corporate profitability, uh, the overall economic outlook, not just here, but uh, abroad as well. So the global economic outlook and the cost and availability of financing mm -hmm. there as well. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. I think one thing that the business community may, may look fondly on both candidates is that both strongly are supporting a major infrastructure commitment from the federal government, mm -hmm. which I think is is very logical to do. I have in, an op inf I'm sorry to interrupt you. Infrastructure and transportation, roads, airports, okay. ports, et cetera, across the board. I think it's very timely. You know, the financing sheep, the economic impact could be great. So I think that's a policy that a lot of people haven't noticed. Both are strongly in favor of this. Mm -hmm. Joe, you said something about TPP and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Both, as you, as you all well know better than I, both states are net exporters of goods and services internationally. Does the outcome of Brexit, does the uncertainty around a Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, do all of these things undermine where North and South Carolina might be 12 and 18 months from now? Well, I think the uncertainty, any outcome where we see a, uh, a negative impact on uh, on different uh, uh, trade relationships with other countries certainly would impact South Carolina. Um, for example, we've already seen an uh, additional uh, appreciation of the U.S. dollar in response to, to Brexit because of the uncertainty. And that uh, increased appreciation over the last year, it's not just from Brexit, it's from other things as well. But as we've seen that happen, uh, we've seen a decline in, in export activity. And the, the Ports Authority recently announced uh, that their uh, cargo volume has been uh, about the same year over year as opposed to the previous year when they had seen a dramatic increase. Mm -hmm. um, so while things are still going smoothly, and we've seen in South Carolina the economy continue to improve over the last several years, in 2016, um, the appreciation of the U.S. dollar has blunted some of that momentum because we're seeing uh, uh, goods essentially be more expensive from the perspective of, uh, of, of foreign customers. So that does impact us in South Carolina. Well, will the opening of the Panama Canal, just a one-off quickly for the South Carolina ports, will the opening of the Panama Canal well, is that is that wind at the back for the ports in South Carolina? I think so. It gives mm -hmm. gives us more opportunity um, and uh, uh, more uh, more reasons to be able to draw companies into South Carolina. Um, and again, just provides us more resources as we move forward. And and Michael, again, one off and staying with this idea of the ports. Uh, Paul Koza, the new ports chief in North Carolina. Mm -hmm has uh, gotten pretty high marks for what he's done in the last 18 months that he's had the job or the last two years or so. Is, that, is there a different strategy that needs to be thought about North Carolina and South Carolina ports together? Can North Carolina compete with that deep water Charleston no, port? No, but we'll get some spillover. And we're also gonna get some inland ports. We just had announced CSX going to develop an inland port in the Rocky Mount area. That's right. going to be big for Rocky Mount. Poor Rocky Mount's been losing jobs and recovery. That's going to be big. Uh, the other thing I think that North Carolina has been, there's been some superficial talk about this, a standalone ag port. Uh, a lot of people are looking for the North Carolina meat industry, which is big, mm -hmm. servicing the, and growing demand for meat worldwide. We need to get that meat out. So maybe down the road we could have a standalone uh, ag port, but we're not going to compete with Charleston in terms of the type of cargo and ships they can bring in. Uh, Rick, it, it, going back to this idea of goods and services and, and the net exporters, what, what's, what's the risk for the Carolinas? Uh, given the headwinds of whatever Brexit fallout might look like 
in a few months or a new administration is I mean, is this is this one of the things that's on the Fed's radar to say, you know, we, we really got to be concerned about these exports? Well, y as you know, Chris, I speak for myself. I don't speak for the Fed, but it's certainly something that's on my radar. Look, we export out of um, our ports $30 billion in goods in both North Carolina and uh, South Carolina. Um, the Brexit impact, I think, is going to be a relatively minor one. Look, the UK is only about 4% of global GDP. Um, we did see some disruption in financial markets and some uncertainty uh, showing up there. We saw a drop of about 5 percent in the, the S&P 500, but that has since reversed course. So volatility is down, risk spreads have come down uh, somewhat, and the S&P 500, of course, is now at or near record highs. So I don't think Brexit is going to have a long-lasting impact or large impact on the U.S. economy. I think it's going to be relatively minor, except, of course, in the U.K. Mm -hmm. Let's take a pass at the capital markets for a second. You, you've all kind of, you, 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 Rick, you just said the S&P which represents the equity markets in the United States is at a record highs. And you could argue that bonds <clears throat> are at record highs as well. Uh, there was a senior executive at a major bank that uh, confided in me that he felt very worried about financial crack. And that, that was his term. And is the very low cost or the no cost of borrowing money or of using money. And it has pushed all of these capital markets to record limits. Is, is this about confidence, or is this just about access to cheap capital? I think it's about conf both. I think there's, there's a con concern about how long this recovery will last. There's concern about whether the equity markets are, are, have peaked or near peak, and, and they're ready for a major correction. There's a concern about when the next recession is going to occur. And there's an interpretation that low interest rates are a sign not of health of the economy, but of big long-term problems in the economy. Slow growth, slow mm -hmm. population growth, et cetera. Uh, problems in education, we're not educating people, perhaps, to the, the, that was mentioned to the skills they need. So uh, I am somewhat, I'd say I'm 25% I'm, I'm right now concerned that the equity markets may be nearing a peak and we're going to have a major correction. I think that 2018 may be the year that we could start really seriously thinking a recession could happen. So 25%. So uh, one out of four is, is where your worry is. Yeah. Joey, how do you come down on that? Well, when I look at, uh, we look at construction markets, particularly uh, both residential and, and commercial, but the, the demand is there, especially in terms of residential construction. And if we look at developers and builders, um, so right now, because it's based on employment growth and we're seeing, again, we're seeing the demand there um, that at least in the short run this is a an economy that's um, uh, doing well housing markets are doing well in South Carolina so I tend to be more uh, optimistic from that perspective just because when we compare what's happening now to what was happening during the housing boom um, house prices are appreciating in conjunction with or going right along with the increases we're seeing in employment growth whereas in the previous expansion those were a bit more out of line which caused a bit more worry but I think in the short run at least uh, through 2017 right now there are not a lot of any uh, a lot of major indicators that suggest that we're headed for a recession you know you guys, you guys are just queuing this up too easily for <laughs> these questions so Rick the natural progression from what <laughs> Joey just said this this idea that Commercial real estate, commercial development, residential development are, are again, expansionary. There's no doubt about that, mm -hmm. and again, at record levels. Uh, again, many have said that commercial real estate developers will develop um, because they have access to cheap capital. It doesn't have anything to do with the economy. That's kind of their bogey. That's what they look at. If I, can, if I feel like I can sell this product and build it cheap enough, I'm going to go ahead and build it. Um, is that a concern? Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you didn't ask me the question about putting a probability on a recession because I'd be absolutely <laughs> crazy to do that here in this in this context. But I think that maybe that's one of the factors um, that that developers consider when they're going to decide whether they're going to do a project or not. But look again, at the end of the day, they're going to be looking at the fundamentals of things. They're going to be looking at em employment growth, for example, because if you think about commercial construction, wh what is a commercial building? It's really housing for employees. So that's one factor that the, they're going to be looking. At. They're also going to be looking at, again, corporate profitability. They're going to be looking at vacancy rates, occupancy rates, and rents, things of that nature. And then they're going to be looking at these the cost and, and um, availability of financing. I think there are a couple reasons to be concerned if you're a, a, a real estate developer, particularly on the rental side. 
Um, one is that, yes. Draw, residential rental or? Residential commercial? rental. Uh, yes, definitely. Employment growth is, is the key there. But we're looking, many economists think, at a big influx of unemployment caused by technology coming in to the workforce mm -hmm. and really going into areas that's never gone before. That's one concern. The other concern from the rental residential is the millennials are pushing that. But the millennials are beginning to age. They're beginning to partner, marry, have children. And, and history shows they're going to start moving into the single family area. So I'd be a little concerned if I was an investor right now in rental residential. Do you think we are close to having too much inventory? In I that? think in some markets, yes. Yeah, Joey? I think especially when you look around uh, uh, student housing, university housing, uh, because we're seeing a, a huge construction boom around uh, uh, around student housing and and college enrollment, uh, and is is that sustainable given the the student loan debt uh, that that we're seeing mm -hmm. from a national perspective? So that's that, that's a whole nother market, um, but I think that's that speaks to the same concerns. Mm -hmm. same so if you concerns. draw your attention to markets like Charleston with the schools and and with the high growth of of course the Triangle, Char Charlotte, Columbia, Greenville, Furman, those areas like that with the student population with the millennials. Are those markets that are at risk for having too much inventory? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Then Short what? answer. Then what happens? Well, there'll be an adjustment. There'll be, I mean, markets will adjust. So we're, I think we're collectively trying to give perhaps a heads up to investors and in saying where we might see some flashing yellow signs. And that's one area where I see a flashing or flashing light. But it is light. very market specific. And I, yeah, I think yes. it's, you can't paint it with a broad brush. Right. So if you're a, a builder going in for a, you know, a single family price point, uh, that demand may be just fine because we're seeing employment growth and income growth that's supporting that type of, of activity. But w exam uh, coming back to the, the student housing example, yeah. that may not be as sustainable. So it's very market specific, but it's ultimately demand driven. And that's but, what I was, I, I would be more bullish on, on uh, residential ownership units rather than residential rental units. Right, and Chris, I, one thing I like to point out when we're talking about multifamily, it is market specific. If you take a look at the numbers nationally, yes, we've seen multifamily increasing at a rate that's above what I think most folks would consider to be a longer term trend, but that's been taking place for two, maybe two and a half, three years. Look at the underdevelopment that's been taking place in the single family market. What is that, what does that so mean? mean? That means if you take investment? a look, yeah, if you take a look at housing starts and building permits, they have been well below longer mm -hmm. term trends mm -hmm. for the last six, seven years. So ultimately, housing units aren't up as much, but it's going to be market specific where you see this kind of overbuilding in, in certain places. Sure, you're going to have a problem, but I think nationally, um, the numbers are, are, are still kind of favorable, particularly for the single family development. Some of that, some of that I think, though, is pushed by the fact that we're growing population-wise and household-wise at a much slower rate than we have in decades mm -hmm. past. You mean nationally or Na regionally? Well, nationally as well. North Carolina, same thing. Yeah, uh, I think probably southeast. And that, I think, some say is the new normal. Mm. You know, this is, this is an easy way to say this, but doesn't, that, doesn't the in-migration to both Carolinas kind of bail us out of running into some problems because we know we're going to have a built-in growth rate? But it's slowed. And I've looked recently how, how at so? the, in I've looked, well, at the immigration to North Carolina, I've looked specifically at North Carolina from other states has dramatically slowed in the last decade. Uh, in fact, in my movement between states has slowed nationwide and, and there's a lot of head scratching about why that's the case. Uh, there have been some studies who have debunked the idea that's, that it's the problem of selling homes, that that's not it, that there are other factors at work. So, yeah, I think North Carolina, South Carolina in particular, if you look at their growth over the last quarter century, really driven by in-migration, if that's slowing, then that's going to result in a slower growing uh, GDP growth rate in both states, which some say is fine. Uh, we can, slow growth to normalization to yeah. yeah. What? what, what are, go ahead, Joey. Oh, I was just going to say, up? I agree that in South Carolina, uh, tourism is a huge part of our economy. Um, and we've seen that even, even recently getting to uh, looking at uh, this kind of uh, uh, a tangent, but but energy markets and seeing lower gas prices, and that's uh, helped stimulate our tourism economy. But uh, in migration has been a huge boom, especially for the coastal regions of the state. So so very broadly, macro on the economy, and we've got we've got a few minutes left, so I want to get to a couple other points. But very broadly, when you're driving down the road and not ha not having to be under television lights and you know being on the bubble to say, well, this is what I think. What do you think most? to say, you know, but I, what I'm really concerned, what I'm watching, what I think is an issue that we're not paying attention to is what? Rick, what is that, that unknown? Um, you know, Chris, when we take a look at the economy, um, 
we what we've been seeing over the past several years since the Great Recession is kind of this modest increase in output, and everybody's been somewhat disappointed with that. Um, I, and and the reasons for that are many, but most notably the fundamental factors that typically drive economic growth, at least on the national level, is going to be related to growth in the labor force and growth in productivity. Both have been very very slow um, over the course of this economic recovery. But it's when we start to look forward, where you start to see something. Here's something you've got to look at. In, in, in terms of overall economic growth potential is the very slow growth that's anticipated in the working age population. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics is, is estimating that um, the, the working age population is going to grow by basically five tenths of one percent for the next seven or eight years. So the question then in your mind is, well, where does the rest of the economic growth come from? Okay, Joey? I, well, I think technology is one. How is technology being incorporated, which we've already talked about, into, into the workplace, and how is that disrupting labor markets, uh, both in the short run and, the, and, and uh, what's gonna happen in the long run? Uh, but secondly, getting back to uh, looking at the relationship between businesses and employees. And one of the things that we've seen over the last several years is that more employment growth is coming from uh, from freelance workers, essentially. Uh, the 1099? Cate category, yes, that we call uh, uh, employment services, for lack of a better term. And that, that's been going up for the last several years um, because as, as we see um, uh, labor costs shift and change and, and health care is part of that. But what is, what is this long-run shift in terms of more of a freelance economy? Uh, what does that mean for, uh, for, for the... Uh, the structure of the mm -hmm. U.S. economy going forward and that relationship between businesses and employees. Do you think the acceleration of that change is greater than it has been in the past? Oh, it's definitely greater than it has been, at least if we look uh, over the last five years or so. We've been seeing a, a dramatic increase. We see some, some increase yeah. following a recession uh, because, of course, employers, when they're more uncertain, they're more likely to hire on a part-time or freelance basis, and then they shift more into a full-time mode. But that shift hasn't occurred as dramatically as it has in the past following previous recessions. Um, and I think that's new, and we're still seeing what the long-term implications of that are gonna be. Yeah. When I drive down the road in North Carolina, whether it's an interstate or a country road, the thing I am most worried about is will our educational system be able to respond to the new, new skill needs of the future economy? I know this is an old story, but I think it needs to be retold and reemphasized a lot. Right now in North Carolina, we have about 50,000 uh, work age people who are idle, mm -hmm. who don't have a job, they're not even looking for a job. We got another 160,000 folks who are working part time, but they'd rather work full time. So I think the big challenge for North Carolina, for South Carolina over the next quarter century is going to be to look at all levels of education, K through 12, community college, four year college, and look at the structure of those institutions and look at the interactions of those institutions with, with uh, employers and I think retraining is going to be a big, big need in the future. Mm -hmm. Workers losing their occupation because of technology, having to be retrained, maybe when they're in their 30s or 40s. And you know, you go, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and even when we look at, uh, at high school students and, and college students, teaching them to think about what the long-term uh, uh, implications are of their career choices. So having a better understanding about uh, what wages are going to look like in the, in the professions that they're looking towards. Uh, how do they finance that responsibly? What does that cost benefit look like? And, and not to suggest that college education is just about vocation training, but that's an important component of it. Certainly not about less than that. And I think a better understanding of how those relationships play out uh, becomes vitally important particularly given all the discussions surrounding uh, student debt. Is it, Rick, is there a way, and there's about a minute, minute and a half left, is there a way to make the, the points that both Joey and Mike just made about education being the, single, the singular priority? I, I would go further and say, in saying just education reform, I would say human capital development is really the issue that we're talking about. Look, if we, if we think of ourselves as each of us as kind of a little factory, that, that we ultimately in life are, we're going to produce something. The more um, s skills and the more flexibility you can build into that factory, the more likely you are to increase your earnings, the less likely you are to be exposed to economic shocks. So I think at the end of the day, what we want to look at is not just the educational system, but how do we get more people participating in the educational system? How do we get more of those folks participating in the economy? Okay. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. The Fed guy gets the last, uh, last one. <laughs> no, thank as, you. Yeah, that seems appropriate, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Uh, Rick, mm -hmm. thanks for being on the thank program. You. Joey, good to see you again. Good to see you. Michael, as always, nice thanks to have us. you here. You've been you. coming for at least two decades, yes, and we yes. appreciate your participation yes. on, the, on the program. Makeup free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only one that doesn't get makeup. I love that about you. Independent thinker. Um, thank you for watching our program. Hope your summer is going well. If you have any questions or comments, uh, in any way, go to carolinabusinessreview.org. It's a long name, but it's worth it. carolinabusinessreview.org and make your comment. Thank you. Until next week, good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.